When you were here before Couldn't look you in the eye You're just like an angel Your skin makes me cry You float like a feather 
in a beautiful world. You're so very special. I wish I was special, but I'm a creep. I'm a weirdo. What the hell am I doing here? I don't belong here. I don't care if it hurts. I don't care if it hurts. I wanna have control. I wanna have control. I want a perfect body. I want a perfect body. I want a perfect soul. I want a perfect soul. I want you to notice when I'm not. But I'm a creep I'm a weirdo What the hell am I doing here? I don't belong here No, no She's right Whatever you want, you're so very special. I wish I was special. I wish I was special. That was amazing. It also made me think that that's just the inner monologue in Trump's head constantly. <laughs> he's in the mirror shaving, and he's just like, I'm a freak, I'm a freak, I'm a freak, I wish. Um, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How was your night last night? Did you do it? Was it OK? Awesome. Um, I'm tired, but um, I was happy to see all of you. Those of you I didn't see, I understand. What? Oh, you're very sweet. You're very sweet to say. Thank you. Um, it was just really, I, I actually really just was so honored and grateful that so many of you came because I do just take up so much of your time. And so to have you come and spend more of it with me made me feel really great and to learn a little bit. I'm, I'm very, very lucky that I get to show what my work in, in real time and practice um, at this conference. So it's really kind of nice. So thank you very much. And um, for those of you who will come to your town, just let me know. Okay, I'll show up. Um, so welcome. This block, it's our final day. That always feels a little bit like 
end of summer camp, very sad. Did you get to know? Did you get to kiss the person you wanted? Like, did you get numbers? Are you going to be writing? Um, all that stuff. But um, we're kicking off the final day um, with moral emotions, which I like kicking off the final day with moral emotions because I think that, as we've talked a lot about throughout the course of, the, of, the, of our time here, the fact that we need to recheck in with what morality actually means these days, right? So the emotionality of moral emotions, where they exist, where they don't, are they going away? Can we bring them back up and harness them and put them into the forefront of who we are and what our work is and hold people accountable to have them, for fuck's sake. So I'm excited. So the curator of our moral emotions, that is a giant job. She's just going to do it, um, is the lead speaker coach here at Frank. She, this is her fifth year of being a speaker coach. Um, she's a writer and content strategist who focuses on issue advocacy. Um, she uses strategic storytelling to drive systems of social change in healthcare and helping people who are visually impaired, refugees, and other groups facing systematic injustice. Um, she's also somebody I have known since the aughts. We have been doing this work together for a really long time, and I am thrilled and delighted to be able to bring her to the stage to you. Please welcome Amy Lynn Smith. <laughs> Good morning, and I am so delighted and honored to be here among all of you. Uh, moral emotions are something I've been giving a lot of thought to because they are messy and hard to define. They encompass such a wide range of emotions. Outrage, shame, guilt, indignation, empathy, a sense of right and wrong. So. Are moral emotions our conscience talking to us? That's what I think. Moral emotions are our conscience. That's one of the key messages behind a TV show called The Good Place. <laughs> ah, I see we have a lot of fans of The Good Place, right? Show of hands. OK, you're all going to The Good Place. <laughs> if you haven't watched it or don't watch it, you risk going to the bad place. <laughs> Um, the show has moral emotions at its heart, and I promise no spoilers, but I am going to talk about it just a little bit because it's a model for weaving moral emotions into a narrative. As creator Michael Shore said, people don't like to be lectured to, so he felt that comedy was the appropriate and correct uh, delivery mechanism. The story centers around humans who either go to the good place or the bad place based on their actions during their lives. They earn or lose points based on those actions and how they treat each other, and their point total determines where they go when they die. But on The Good Place, moral emotions and ethics aren't theoretical. They're actually played out in a sort of virtual reality. In one episode, a moral philosophy professor is talking about the classic ethical dilemma, the trolley problem. You are driving a trolley and the brakes fail. And you can either kill five people or switch tracks and kill one. What do you do? But instead of talking about the experience, the professor ends up living it. It's not easy to decide, right? And really, we're all living out the trolley problem every day. Just hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not with life and death stakes. But The Good Place also reminds us of that little voice in our heads that tells us if we're doing something good or bad. It's our conscience. Moral emotions are our conscience. So as social change communicators, we're not often going to have the kind of creative freedom The Good Place did. But we can use moral emotions in our work. Most people have a conscience we can appeal to, like these volunteers at a food bank. So we can use science and strategy to identify and harness moral emotions that are most likely to move people to act. We can use moral emotions to appeal to people's values, to make them give a fork, as they say on The Good Place, <laughs> and to catalyze them to take action. We know moral emotions drive action because plenty of people have done it all on their own. Oscar Schindler and others who saved countless Jews during the Holocaust. David Hogg and Emma Gonzalez, just two of the teens who survived the Parkland school shooting and stood up to demand change. 
Greta Thunberg, whose outraged speeches earned her the honor of Times Person of the Year, and quite a few mentions here at Frank this year. External forces can also drive action through moral emotions. More than 10 years ago, Huntington, West Virginia was named the most obese city in the country. They were fat shamed nationally, and the mayor admitted it was embarrassing. So the city mobilized. Hospitals and schools launched health programs. Students started farmers markets. And volunteer coalitions taught people how to make healthier eating choices. In the decades since the shaming, the mayor alone has lost 60 pounds, and the city's obesity rate has dropped 15%. That's something to feel proud of. There's another proven model for using moral emotions to drive social change. As part of working toward my master's degree in public interest communication here at UF online. Uh, right, right, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the program. Everybody should check it out. But uh, as in one of my courses, I learned about the uh, Turner's anger activism model. And even though we've already heard about anger, the model tells us that evoking a sense of outrage or unfairness can catalyze people, but only if we give them a very specific call to action. So what do these examples tell us? As communicators, we can use strategy and communications to encourage people to act on their conscience. The next three speakers are going to show you how it's done. One of them is going to tell you about a way to identify and measure moral emotions, data you can use to develop strategic communications. You're also going to hear two stories from people who were moved to take action out of a, an emotional response to right and wrong. One of them exemplifies the anger activism model, in my opinion, and the other is going to share a personal experience with a call to action I hope you'll heed. Every day, humans are provoked to feel any number of moral emotions. It's their conscience talking to them. It's that little voice in their head talking to them. As communicators, we can talk to them too and encourage them to act on their conscience and then tell them what they can do to take action and make the world just a little bit better than it was the day before. And with that, I will leave it to our esteemed speakers who are going to take you to a very good place. Thank you. All right. Let's dig deep into our morals and our emotions. This will be fun. Um, coming up first is director of UC Santa Barbara's Media Neuroscience Lab, which investigates complex cognitive responses to mass communication. Today, he's going to talk about moral emotion theory, a belief that there are a set of moral emotions that are cross-cultural. Now, some believe this is impossible. He firmly believes that we have objective morality. In fact, he created a moral narrative analyzer to see how people use moral framing for issues. So please welcome Renee Weber. Hello, everybody. Um, so good to be here. Um, Frank is the best organized conference I've ever been. So a big thank you to the organizer and to all of you for having me here today. It's um, a pleasure. I have to say, I indulge myself in all these great talks and in free food and free drinks. <laughs> it's almost unfair to my coworkers and my students in my lab. They work hard. The Oscars are coming up on Sunday. They get some stuff done. And I feel guilty. Uh, at the same time, I think I'm getting the message out. I care for their well-being, for their careers. So I'm a good person. I deserve this indulgence. You know? <laughs> so that's what I mean with moral emotions. Um, what I just did was moral framing and was moral justification. And we have heard here a number of times that emotions motivate actions. You know? And But what are emotions? Emotions are superordinate adaptive programs designed to orchestrate subordinate um, uh, emotions or, or cognitive programs um, to, to create an optimal response that is survival relevant for humans. So let's take fear, for example. 
fear is an adaptive response to threat. And it increases attention, which is good. It makes you literally think faster, which is also good. There's a predator around. And it deactivates lower order needs, you know, such as impressing or looking for mates. Bad idea if a predator is around. Or craving for food or craving for sleep. You know? So basic emotions are emotions where one has to uh, monitor your own physical response to an emotional trigger. Social emotion, in contrast, are emotions where we have to monitor and understand the actions and thoughts of others. Moral emotions is a special class of social emo emotions. Moral emotions are not just about positive or negative or about intensity. They are about what is good, what is bad, what is right, and what is wrong. So um, we know that um, moral emotions um, even motivate action even more. So we know, for example, from the literature that voting behavior is influenced by moral emotions, obviously. We do know that messages that contain moral messages are more persuasive. We do know that moral appeals increase charitable donations. And we do know that messages with moral information diffuse faster through large audiences. Well, basic emotions are kind of a response to emotional displays with emotional triggers. Moral emotions are more complex. So if you look at this chart here, as I just said, moral emotions are obviously a part of monitoring actions of others. But they also depend on the intention of people. We assign morality depending on what was the intention for an action. They even depend on outcomes. Well, we infer intentionality if outcomes are negative. But if they are positive, sometimes we do not infer intentionality. Sometimes we justify good outcome makes behavior suddenly moral. Most crucially, they depend on individuals' individual sensibilities to moral norms. I'll talk more about this in a second. And of course, their own experience, what they have learned, what is good and what is bad. Crucially, they depend on the type and intensity of the moral conflict. Moral conflict defined as situations where we have to violate one moral norm in order to uphold another moral norm. We had a wonderful example two days ago with uh, Senator Romney. He violated the norm of loyalty to his uh, party, what he believes he needs to uphold in his view what is just and what is fair. So with this, um, let me go to this um, model here. Um, so moral foundation theory uh, talks about so-called five moral foundations. There's a sixth moral foundation in the making, not out here. But it says, essentially, these moral foundations, they are universal. They are represented in all human cultures. They're innate. So these are care and harm. Care, the positive side. Harm would be the violation of a care a moral foundation. Fairness, cheating, addressing reciprocity between humans. Loyalty, betrayal, protecting your group. Authority, subversion and sanctity and desecration. So you can test your morals. Here you can go to yourmorals.org. And for the fun of it, I just did it for myself with the threat of disclosing too much about myself here. But, <laughs> but let's see here, though this, let me explain this chart. Green here is my moral sensibility, so 4.2. Um, blue one is the average value of about uh, 230,000 liberals in the United States. And uh, red is uh, the number of about 70,000 uh, conservatives in the country. So as you can see, my sensibility for care and harm through the roof, 4.2, better than all these liberals here. <laughs> so <laughs> then if I look at here, fairness, cheating, doing well. I have uh, sensibilities towards fairness and cheating. But now, sorry, my loyalty is not really high. So keep that in mind if you think about to collaborate with me on a project or something. Um, <laughs> then authority, oh my god, it's getting worse. I'm not into authority and subversion. And to my own surprise, I have to say, 
I am not at all into sanctity and desecration. So that means um, framing issues in sanctity or desecration is not a matter for me for what is right or what is wrong. <laughs> well, so with these, um, there's a model. Huh? When we look into campaigns and in media messages and how they work, this model within the last 10 years has received a lot of attention, huh? a lot of evidence. So the model of intuitive morality and exemplar, or in brief, the mime, would say, let's look into how issues are morally framed or how text campaigns that you create contain moral information and let's see how this information interacts you know, with the moral individual sensibility of different groups. And let's see how these messages are embedded in a larger context. Then the mind will describe very specific moral conflict pattern, which then in turn will predict how people self-select or select certain messages and how they evaluate these messages, which then also feeds back again, because messages that we expose ourselves to will sort of influence our own moral intuitions, will reinforce them, and also it will uh, influence how content producer will create their messages, give the audience what they want. So this dynamic can be very nicely described. So there's a lot of evidence for this model. And if there's evidence, wouldn't it be cool if we could sort of measure that and do that on a large scale? And that's what Mona does. So if you can uh, see it here, Mona, neuroscience.org, feel free to explore it. Mona uh, analyzes uh, data at a large scale. And what it essentially does, it has a computational pipeline. It looks into intuitions from large crowds. It crawls the internet. We have a fire hose of of, of global news, actually, every 30 minutes update, you can see the moral composition of the world as represented in news, and you can score text, but, whoops, you can score, oop, that was too fast, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you can score text, and there's a, a kind of a modeling uh, interface, and also an interface where we can distribute our findings. Um, we have applied MONA in various contexts. So for example, we can look at news and events dynamics. So how do events obviously drive news? But how do news then create new events? The Arab Spring would be a great example. We'll look into movie and story performance. How do sequences of moral conflict predict the performance of movies? And now upcoming Oscars on Sunday, we'll look into how moral framing of women and underrepresented minorities and address some myth that women and unworthy minorities do not do well at box office, not true, and much more. Follow us on Media Noro and talk to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was super excited to take the quiz and tell, I, you seem perfectly fantastic, and then I was like, I'm not checking my moral framework. There is no way. It would be such a fail. Um, oh my gosh. Um, I love, um, I just, oh, I hate this last day. It's always so crazy. So um, next coming up is we're going to meet the final of our Corel Fellows um, that you will meet. And um, it's always just a joy to be able to have somebody come back and, and have an awe moment. Because I think when, when folks are, are younger and young, you know, it's like, reliving someone's first experience with their passion for working for injustice and really being in a real world space is like a good reminder of we all had that moment and what drove us. And so I love hearing so much from these Corel Fellows. And um, our final Corel Fellow coming, they are a Jack Kent Cook scholar studying anthropology at Mount Holyoke College. Um, yeah. They're a first-generation, low-income, queer student of color, and they're deeply committed to building youth leadership and intergenerational collaboration. Uh, their talk today is going to be about their experience while interning at Martha's Table uh, in the summer of 2019. They uncovered the power of active listening to challenge bias and lessen the gaps between the people at Martha's Table and the donors, so bringing that gap together. So please welcome Kia Steam. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> I struggle to relate to wealthy people. 
I blame my bias growing up in a working class family where my parents have to choose between putting food on the table or paying the month's rent. I struggle to ignore people experiencing homelessness, especially as I grow and these bills just wrap around my wrists like handcuffs. Back in Washington, D.C., I walked by a man rattling his cup for change, swimming in a sea of suits and ties, ignoring him. My hometown's small, and we know most of the visibly homeless by name, and so I stop, disrupting the morning rush and dig deep into my pockets. Guilt crams my throat as I realize I have no change, and so I stand there, really awkward. Hey, man, uh, I'm dry today, I'm sorry. Nah, you're good, the name's Alvin. I don't move as people brush by, annoyed. Hey, Alvin, um, what's your story? He looks up as if seeing me for the first time. You want to know my story? There's no monetary return in our exchange, only a brief moment of human connection. And in the following days, I saw more people walk by Alvin, and this simple question kept me up at night. We all have morals, right? We all have a heart. And yet, why do so many wealthy people walk by Alvin and I don't? And so, I breathe. Can y'all breathe with me real quick? <sighs> Hi, my name's Key, and I'm a budding anthropologist and social entrepreneur. To sum up my entire life story, I've come from rags to secondhand clothing. <laughs> when I discovered the Frank Carell Fellowship, I looked into this thing called public interest communications and realized, hmm, there might be actually a career out there for me. And so, during the summer of 2019, I arrived in Washington, D.C. and was wowed by the diversity. I mean, everyone was well-dressed and seemed employed. And so, I thought, what's the wealth gap like out here, huh? And so, on my first day traveling to work on the circulator bus, I remember looking out the window as national monuments towered over groups of tents and foreclosed buildings lined the streets. I know the signs of gentrification and realized at that moment that Washington, D.C. was no different, and yet why do I always search for change? <sighs> Luckily, my job in communications at Martha's Table was welcoming. This 40-year-old nonprofit in Southeast D.C. is centered on early childhood, education, food access, and community support. I started gathering the stories about the impact of Martha's Table's programs in the community and with each conversation, I came to learn more about Southeast D.C., that it's made up of 180,000 people where one in eight face barriers to affordable housing. Nationally, millions face housing insecurity. I kept getting stuck on how. How can I help change this? And so I challenged myself to listen and breathe, opening up my conversations to the resilience of the community, not just what's broken. I came to learn that Martha's Table invests in people like Alvin, such as McKenna's Wagon, a food truck that serves hot, healthy meals 365 days a year at no cost. They don't save him, y'all. Martha's Table is a bridge to resources, and Alvin knows he has a seat at the table. And to me, that's change. I finally knew what I had to do as a storyteller and an advocate. If I'm to help bridge this wealth gap thing, I needed to be the change I searched for, and Alvin deserves. So when I met my first donor at Martha's Table, I didn't avoid the interaction. I embraced it. I asked, can I tell you a story? Because I, I saw this as a moment to build a bridge. And she nodded. On my way to work, I always passed this man named Alvin who's experiencing homelessness. And I stopped and asked him his story. I stopped because I see myself in him. He's homeless because of debt. He's homeless because freedom costs money. And money costs freedom. And then costs just keep stacking with debt as it's backing, and so he waits for change. And she nods, remembering all of the people like Alvin that she walked by and did not offer change. And so, she asks, how can I help? How can you help? 
The next time you walk by someone like Alvin, don't just give him change. Be the change. You know, be a resource. I carried around hygiene kits in Washington, D.C. with condoms and protein bars and tampons. I even made this resource guide about the resources at Martha's Table. How can you be the bridge in your hometown? How can you help connect people to resources like Martha's Table? I mean, MT helps a lot of people, but they just can't reach everyone. So show up and listen. You'll be more than a communicator. You will be an advocate, able to translate Alvin's story into systemic change. You and you and you are the bridge. So cross that wealth gap. Because I could be him, and he could be you. Thank you. Freedom costs money, y'all. Did that hit everybody right in the gut? Man, so awesome. Um, coming up now is my neighbor. We just realized we were neighbors. I feel very excited. Um, she's a 25-year veteran of the New York City public school system and founding and former principal of the Khalil Gibran International Academy in Brooklyn, New York, founder and CEO of Bridging Cultures, Inc. Um, and currently, she is the board president of the Muslim Community Network. Her talk today uh, is <clears throat> focuses on her experience as a Yemeni American. Um, the Muslim ban generated a bunch of moral and emotional despair, and people didn't know what to do. And there was an incredible, incredible event that my next guest um, orchestrated, and it was it really transformed Brooklyn and New York City and brought us together in a way that was really powerful, and I cannot wait for you to hear the story. Please welcome Dr. Debbie Almentasser! Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and greetings, my sisters and brothers. What an honor it is to be amongst the best thinkers in the world. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share a story with you. I want to start by first saying that I am a proud Yemeni American and unapologetically Muslim. I stand today in front of you on the, on the shoulders of giants, giants who have now created a voice for themselves and a place at the table. It all started that evening of election day, where we were all feeling hopeful and thinking we're going to have the first female president in the United States. I walked into the Jacob Javits Center thinking history is going to be made. There was laughter, there was excitement, people were drinking, people were talking, the polls closed, the numbers began to come in, and as they came in, the chatter and the laughter decreased. As more numbers came in, they continued to decrease until you can finally hear a pin drop. And at that moment, all I saw was fear terror, despair, and trauma beginning. And the first image that went into my head was of Donald Trump promising to have a complete Muslim shutdown. I thought of all of the young people that I knew, the mothers, the fathers, the community members who reminisced on this promise and were terrified. And was so frightened myself, I felt vulnerable. I felt targeted. I didn't know what to do with that moment. 
I immediately started getting text messages from young people and parents. Should I send my children to school tomorrow? I'm so afraid for them. And at that moment, I had to pull myself together and show moral courage. I started to text them back and say, yes, you have to live your life. This is America. You are American. Don't let anyone make you feel any different. <coughs> and the weeks ahead and the months ahead, the unfathomable happened. Donald Trump signed the Muslim ban executive order. I was at an event commemorating Arab heritage. I got the call, and when I heard that he signed the executive order, I felt like someone sucked the air out of me. I felt paralyzed. I felt numb. And all I could think about was my community and what we were going to do. Another moment of getting text message after text message, and these text messages were from my beloved Yemeni American community leaders saying, what does this mean for us? What's going to happen to us? Are we going to be able to reunite with our family? Does this mean we have to leave the United States? And I immediately started responding by saying, no, please calm down. Let's meet tomorrow, and we will strategize around this issue. The following morning, like thousands of Americans, I went to JFK Terminal 4, where thousands and thousands of individuals came out in protest of the Muslim ban. I was there from 11 to 9 PM, and then went to meet with my beloved Yemeni American leaders. When I got to that meeting, I saw the long faces. I saw the fear. And I saw the terror of like what's going to happen to us. 9-11 was a moment that shook my community. And now the Muslim ban and Donald Trump was another moment to shake my community. At this meeting, we talked about strategizing to educate our community. And the one message that I had for each and every one of them was, please tell your family members not to travel until further notice. Go home, call your friends, call your neighbors, wherever you go, spread the news. Monday morning, I get a call from one of the very gentlemen who was at that meeting. And he said to me, I was with a bunch of bodega owners who are upset who are angry and who want to do something. And I said, what would they like to do? He said, they want to do a bodega strike. But they wanted to get your approval first. I said, I love the idea. How many bodegas do you want to close? And they said to me, oh, 200. I said, no, I want 1,000. I will get you the media. I will get you the location for this rally. And we're going to make it happen. They created a poster, put it up in all of their bodegas. They shut down from 12 to 8 p.m. And I wanted it from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And the pushback was simply this. We don't want to disrupt our neighbors' morning routine. We want to make sure our neighbors get their coffee, their paper. We want to make sure the kids get their snack. We care about these very people, and we want to make sure that we don't disrupt their lives. I said, OK, 12 PM it is. On February 2nd, they closed their stores at 12. Some of them decided to show up at 12.30. Don't ask me why at Brooklyn Borough Hall. They were supposed to be there at 4.30. I get a call from Borough Hall saying to me, they're out here. What time did you tell them to get here? I said, 4.30. They're like, well, there are 50 people here now. I wait an hour. There are 500 people here. I was like, what is going on? My poor husband, who worked a 12-hour shift, I sent him to Burrell Hall to troubleshoot and tell them to go to the mosque, go to Starbucks, which I would never tell anybody to go. <laughs> but they needed to go somewhere. He gets there. They're like, no, we're staying. And it was a very cold and windy day. 
My fellow colleague, who is one of the organizers, called up a comedian, and he did a Facebook Live to entertain them until we began. And when I got there at 3 o'clock, this is the sea of people that I saw at 3 p.m. They were praying and waiting for us to begin. Never in my wildest dreams did I think this tweet would you know, get 22,000 um, retweets, but it was profound. And what was beautiful was these people were hanging from the fringes of the flags and cheering USA, USA. And I don't know why they kept saying USA, USA at that moment, but I was like, okay, I will embrace it. <laughs> and I let them chant it. It was the young, the old, every person that felt affected came out that day. And in the months after the bodega strike, we realized that this community needed to be mobilized and organized. And I helped co-found the Yemeni American Merchants Association, an organization working to educate, advocate, and elevate Yemeni Americans in the United States. It's become an organization that has become a voice for this community. This past Saturday, we had our second year anniversary. And in preparation for 2020, we have launched a C4 Yama action to get politically engaged in the political process, where we are going to lobby for our interest and also influence races and make sure that we put people into office that reflect who we are and our values. In addition, after a national search, we hired our first executive director. This organization has made leaps and bounds. And I hope that you are inspired to help us continue to grow by donating. If you're in New York, or if you ever come to New York, come volunteer with us. If you want to contact us, the information is there. You can also reach out to me and you can follow us on Twitter. Our latest campaign is actually boycotting the New York Post. We have, up until today, made sure that 1,500 stores are not carrying the New York Post. Yeah. So I thank you for having me, and uh, this is such an honor and a blessing. Thank you so much. Um, I just have to say, one of the things, Dr. Amatessa, that I think was, was like so important, being a person who lives in Brooklyn, was to be able to understand that your deli owner was Yemeni. Like, I think a lot of people didn't know like where they were from, and and that was really cool to like really be able to see somebody in a in a in a way culturally that you had, you had a broad sense, but then this, it was great. So. Absolutely, and I love the aspect of even though they were feeling vulnerable and outraged and, and disengaged from their own country, that they still cared about the community they lived in enough to not want to disrupt people's morning rush, yeah. and to care enough to say, we're gonna time this in a way that doesn't hurt the innocent people who support us. Well, I, That's moral emotions right there. It is, and like, <laughs> I just, it's so personal, but, like in my neighborhood, the Yemeni deli in my neighborhood, I don't carry money when I walk my dog. I don't have to have money. They're like, if you don't have it, just pay us. And they have dog treats. And like the, the relationship between your deli in New York and where you live is very true. You give them your house keys, somebody picks them up there. <laughs> they are, it's like, it's really an incredible relationship that in walking cities you really experience, but in a way that's like, you just trust everybody, you know? It's like, where's your dog? It's like, oh, and they're like, oh. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But I'm, I'm so, uh, in working with, with and, and having an opportunity to hear all of our speakers this morning, I'm just so impressed by um, their willingness to really act on their conscience, as I mentioned in my talk. And, and that, that inspired my talk, what they all did mm -hmm. to take decisive 
action. Yeah. And, and also this opportunity, um, uh, Renee's incredible work that helps us understand moral emotions. And if we take the test, I guess we're gonna find out if we're going to the good place or the bad place. I, 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 I don't know. But um, I, it, it's tangible. Uh, it didn't occur to me until I heard about your work that this was something we could measure because it seemed so nebulous and, and what are moral emotions? And, and, and we all have them. Um, like I said, most people have them. There's a couple people in government, a few people I can think of that don't, don't have uh, conscience. But I'm so impressed by this you know, decisive call to action that yeah. we all know as public interest communicators, and, and you and I have talked about this, it's not enough just to simply talk about things, we have to act on them. Well, yeah, and it's like one of the reasons that I left The Daily Show was because in corporate media, you could only do so much, and getting people morally outraged was sort of like, I just felt like an anger fluffer. <laughs> you know, it was like, if I can't say, and then you can do this, right? In the, in the, we've talked about like, you know, tragedy porn, like it was like tying into this whole theme of extracurricular jobs on a porn set that a lot of people don't know exist. <laughs> um, uh, it's important to have that call to action because if you're going to give people the outrage, what are they gonna do with it so they feel empowered? And I think it's really crucial. And, um, and I just think even reminding ourselves that if we're gonna be living in a world that is going to require less of us as moral humans, to not succumb to that. Because shit becomes the norm and then you forget what the moral center is. So that is like, I'm so happy and grateful that people are reminding us constantly, get back there, be there, remember who you are, remember what is good, because in a world that is not showing us what that is, it's up to us to constantly be that barometer. So thank you, exactly. what a great, great, great oh. segment. Thank you, speakers, thanks everybody. Awesome, okay. Y'all know the drill, we have a, we have a recess right now. Um, your folks are in the back of your, uh, Oh my God, I keep not having it in my script because I, Lisa, do you hate me? No, you're good. I feel terrible. I really feel like I should give someone $10,000 just for being a dick. Um, all right, so this is super important. Lisa here, Lisa Fazio is back everybody. Lisa Fazio, who literally ran out and tackled me like I was a criminal, which I like. So Lisa. Um, let's talk about voting. Yes. Let's talk about the Frank Prize. I am out of here just for a minute. Yes. Uh, so we have our wonderful assistant, uh, Frank Helpers, who are going to be handing out these paper ballots for you because it is now time for you to vote on who should win the $10,000 research prize. So yesterday you spent seven minutes in heaven with each of the scientists. Now it's time to vote. So they're gonna hand out the ballots. It's one ballot per person. Mark who you think should win the prize. Their names and pictures are on the ballots. And then when we break for recess, there'll be two people standing at each corner here with baskets. Put them in the basket. Yes, here is one of our lovely people with the basket. There'll be one here too. to break for recess with that. So make sure to hand in your ballots as you head off to your first recess session.